So we sold the house a year and a couple months later for $22.5 million, which is exactly what I suggested from day one. Uh, we had to go through one price reduction to twenty six five, which is where I wanted to be day one. And uh, it closed, and we got paid a million dollars. But the funnest thing about that miracle listing, uh, oh, when I when I listed it, I remember going home that, and I was so excited. I'm like, I got, I got a thirty million dollar listing. But then I'm like, I have no money to market this. What am I going to do? I don't quite remember exactly how I did it, but we did amazing videos. We did it all over the internet, um, which was just kind of starting at that time. We did magazine covers. Luckily, I had company support with that. And uh, but. I just expected a miracle. The miracle fell to my lap. I was ready and prepared. I worked extra hard to get it. I stood firm and I had trained myself for, you know, 15, 18 years on the right dialogues to have those conversations and it worked out. Today we have Christoph Chu, top producing luxury real estate broker in Beverly Hills in Los Angeles for over 32 years, who has just recently ranked the number one real estate video influencer in North America. We are with Christoph Chu in Beverly Hills, and we were discussing and chatting earlier uh, about some of the things that I was doing in my life and, and how, uh, you know, there was definitely not a silver spoon at the table for us. Um, and it's not necessarily an unfortunate thing because, like I was saying, saying to you, I think the, the places that I've been able to get, I would not actually have been able to get there unless uh, I went through some hard times. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just being able to develop and grow that mindset was something that I never thought was possible. Right. Uh, and it still astonishes and amazes me uh, the things that we can do uh, when we put people first, when we grow our relationships, when we uh, do the right things, no matter what. And, you know, even if we take a few steps backwards, we know that if we can firmly have that conviction within our heart that yep. it's going to work, yep. then somehow or another, you know, <laughs> that uh, something happens and you get the one random email or you, you meet the one random person or you get that one connection that just, you know, all of that hard work has, has paid off. So what's one piece of advice that you would give to, to somebody who does look at you and says, you know, Christoph, let's write him off. You know, he's in Beverly Hills. You know, he had everything handed to him. It must have been so easy. If, if you know, if I had that upbringing, I'd be there as well. <laughs> What's something that you would say to the, the people that are, that are listening? That's and a thinking good question. That? And first of all, when you said do the right thing, I was, I was listening to what you were saying. And that exact same phrase came in my mind at the same time. Because yeah. when I started in real estate at 18 years old, which is, you know, 32 years ago now, Jack Douglas owned our company and it was called John Douglas Company. And uh, I think first couple months I met him and one of the, I said, what's your advice to me as a new agent? He says, always do the right thing. Now, I was raised that way, so it just reinforced what I already knew because I was now in the business world. But I, I love it that you, you feel that way. Well, let me reference things. First of all, um, I am in Beverly Hills. I created this life by design. I came from very humble beginnings. My, parent, my mom was a hairdresser. My stepfather was in the art antique business here and locally. And they didn't make a lot of money. My mom, you know, worked very, very hard, six, seven days a week as a hairdresser getting up at 6 a.m. or at the shop at 6 a.m. So I learned about work ethic. She was about family, loving, kindness, being good to people, taking care of people. So I learned that very early on, and I learned about working. So I remember I was 12 years old. I traveled to Europe a few times, so I'd been exposed to traveling and different things, which opened my eyes to the world. Even though my parents were not wealthy, I still had exposure to travel, which uh, I think is a very important thing to expose yourself to. And uh, so as a young person at 12, I wanted money so I could start. I already had dreams since I was very young. I want to live in a castle. And I remember my mom, one of my mom's hair customers gave me a book on castles in France. And I still have that book. And I remember th looking at that and thinking, I want to live in a castle someday. And I want to be rich. And I want to have a Rolls Royce. And so, um, but I learned that it doesn't just fall from the sky. And my parents didn't have the money to do it. So I started working at 12 years old. And I uh, worked uh, for my mom's customers cleaning apartments. I mean, I was I would go to the mom, my mom's shop on Saturday mornings at, you know, get up at five, go with her at six o'clock, help, you know, serve donuts, help with the customers, sweep the floors, all that kind of thing. And then I would go uh, to a couple of her customers' apartments and for four to six hours, I would clean their apartments at 12 years old. But back in the 70s, I was making $60 cash in four hours. And so that's when I started learning about working. And once I got older at 16, I worked for the Hollywood Bowl uh, as a ticket taker. I worked valet parking cars. I worked as a cashier at Dupar's restaurant. I did all sorts of different jobs. I was a, a stylist. I became a fashion model. So I did lots of different jobs because I just wanted to earn money to live a good life. So uh, I think my advice is 
dreams are great. You have to follow your dreams and build on your dreams, write down goals. And I would say it started, I was probably 14 or 15. I found a book at the Goodwill, I think it was, by Catherine Ponder called The Power of Prosperous Thinking. And it was a book about writing down in, in, on paper all the things you want in life, you know, from a spouse to your financial goals, your personal goals, your spiritual goals. And at 14, 15, no one taught me about this stuff. I read this book and I really believed in it. And I started doing it. So, at, you know, at that early age, luckily, I was, I had some, you know, in my own education about, oh, this is where, where I am now. This is what I want. How am I going to get there? So the visualizations, the mindset, the planning, the writing, those things down really helped me. So even to this day, I still do that. I mean, today we use Pinterest and vision boards and things that are more visual. But, you know, it, it's really important to write down what you want, think about what you want all the time. And figure out ways to get there step by step. Because many times people say, oh, you're an overnight success. I said, yeah. <laughs> As of today, it's like 9,800 and something overnights. Yeah. And there, I mean, I've been through a couple of periods in my career where I've had went three or four months without a single sale. And that can be very, I, I'm not a depressed type of person, but you can get, I remember one time I was feeling like I was going in this downward spiral. And, and I was prospecting every day, making my phone calls, but nothing was happening. And I remember saying to my wife and Tom, I said, it's been like three, four months. I haven't made a single sale. What am I wasting? I could have just taken the four months off, right? My wife's like, no, you can't do that. Tom's like, no, keep doing what you're doing. And I don't know if you can see it in the screen, but this particular house, it was a Sunday morning at 8.30. I was at the office and I do get come to the office every single day of the year. And I'm not kidding you. Christmas Day, New Year's Day. I know it may sound crazy, but I live like four minutes away from here. So I just, I can't sit at home. I mean, I'm so used to working and I get up at five thirty, six o'clock, no matter where I am in the world, I just get up early. So get up early, come to the office, even if it's for three or four hours, Christmas morning, just do my emails, do my social media, whatever I got to do. And then I go home and then I can really relax. Uh, but I remember being depressed and, and almost depressed and concerned because feeling like, you know, four months of the high lifestyle in Beverly Hills, no money coming in, no cash flow. And I, what am I going to do? But I kept positively affirming every day what I wanted, expecting miracles to occur. That's one of my affirmations every day. So 8.30 in the morning, I'm at the office. The phone rings, and I pick up the phone. It's friends of ours that own this incredible house. They said, well, we want to have talked to you about selling our house or moving out of the country. And I'm like, wow. I'm like, this is great. And at the time, I knew the house was like 25 to $30 million. This is 10, 11 years ago. And uh, my highest sale at that point was $5 million. And I said, great, wonderful. When you want to meet? Tomorrow, Monday morning, 8 o'clock. Perfect. And uh, so, um, and I don't know how we got to the story, but I think it's an important story. So I turned, got off the phone, called up my wife, said, oh my God, you won't believe who just called me. She says, who? And I told her, and she said, they want me to come talk about selling the house tomorrow. And this was, at that time, one of the most beautiful houses in Los Angeles. And today it's worth probably 55, 60 million. And um, so I, I was ready mentally, physically, and psychologically for this appointment, but it was a very big businessman. He was a very smart guy, and it was a very big listing. And I basically said to my wife, I said, I'm going to spend the rest of the day at the office working on this appointment so I can be ready for tomorrow. And I spent eight hours in my office preparing the presentation for the, the client. And I left at eight, went home, and I was, you know, again, it, I wanted everything ready physically so that if you had any objection, I was prepared for it. And I had everything in writing, all the comps, all the everything just really, really well done. And I went to the house in the morning. And the wife was not there, it was just him and I, and I'd been to the house many times, so I kind of did a quick tour, sat down with him in the entryway, and uh, I said, do you absolutely have to sell your home? He says, well, you know, we're moving um, out of the country, and so yes, we want to sell the house. He didn't say absolutely, but he said yes. I said, are you willing to price the home to sell? And he says, what price do you want to list it for? I said, 26.5 million. He said, what do you think it's worth? I said, 22, 23 million. He says, well, I want to list it for 30 million. I said, okay. I said, if I sell this in the next 30 to 60 days, is that okay for you? He says, well, no, because it was October and we're not leaving till July because the kids are in school. We're finishing out the school year. Uh, I said, so are you okay to do a 12-month listing? He says, yes. Great. He says to me, what's your commission? And that was one of the toughest ones because I had been used to getting 7% and 6%. But at, a, you know, at that price point, you know, f five was unusual. Four was kind of more the norm. So, and I'd Worked this in my mind. I had the contract written. All actually, I'll, it typed up because in those days we weren't really doing win forms. It, you know, was you know com, typed up com, contract. I had six percent in there, and and I smiled. I said six percent, and you know it, it took a lot of guts to do that because I thought this is going to be it, right? Uh, and he says I'm only paying you one million dollars to sell this house, 
And I'd done in my mind the numbers, you know, from six to five and a quarter, 5.75. So I knew what a million meant. So I, I crossed out the 6% and I wrote in $1 million. That's what he said. That's what I wrote in. I didn't know if it was going to work or if it would be accepted, but that's what I wrote. So we sold the house a year and a couple months later for $22.5 million, which is exactly what I suggested from day one. Uh, we had to go through one price reduction to 26.5, which is where I wanted to be day one. And uh, it closed and we got paid a million dollars. But the funnest thing about that miracle listing, uh, oh, when I when I listed it, I remember going home that and I was so excited. I'm like, I got I got a $30 million listing. But then I'm like, I have no money to market this. What am I going to do? I don't quite remember exactly how I did it. But we did amazing videos. We did it all over the internet, um, which was just kind of starting at that time. We did magazine covers. Luckily, I had company support with that. And uh, but I just expected a miracle. The miracle fell to my lap. I was ready and prepared. I worked extra hard to get it. I stood firm and um, I had trained myself for, you know, 15, 18 years on the right dialogues to have those conversations. And it worked out. So uh, it was that was one of my and we got to live in that beautiful estate for nine months, which was amazing. Uh, I think what you're trying to say <laughs> is that you had you had an overnight thing happen but it took you 15 years yeah. plus yeah. to make it happen. Yeah. And a lot of things are now happening that, that I'm super grateful for uh, in my own life yep. that, yes, I do get a random email or I do get a random call that right. I was not expecting per right. se. However, when I'm writing what I'm grateful for, not only am I writing what I currently have, I'm, like you said, creating that life by design. I'm writing about the things that I'm going to attract my way. Exactly. And so that way, when they do come my way and uh, somebody else may think, wow, you know, it was, it was so easy or something, you know, just landed in his lap. Yep. The two people that really know exactly how hard I work are myself and my wife. Yep. And my wife will be the first to say that um, nothing ever lands in his lap right. unless he said it was going to land there. Right. And I'm just huge on on saying, hey, I'm going to do a podcast and this is the benchmarks that we're going to hit. These are the yep. people that we're going to talk about. These are the lives that are going to be transformed. And I think that for anybody listening, as long as you have that conviction yep. um, that it is possible, I can do it. Um, I, d I, d I don't know exactly um, what it takes. I, I don't have to be perfect, but yep. I know that I have to start and I have to just keep doing one thing that's going to get me a little bit closer. Right. So then that way, when the overnight <laughs> success comes, um, there was so much hard work that was put into yeah. that. And, I, and yeah. I think that's huge for, for any aspect, whether it's breaking into a luxury market, uh, whether it's starting a new career, wh whatever it may be, you yeah. have to firmly believe that it's possible yeah. first. Yeah. And I think that goes into uh, your mindset. And what would be some of the things that you do to train your mind to get you to a place that you didn't think was possible uh, or you didn't think was uh, you, you didn't even think that, you know, that can be, that can happen. Well, I would say mindset is probably the number one most important thing every day for me. Um, we're all human beings. We wake up some days not feeling so great or positive or feel down or a deal may be going sideways or a deal crashes that you're expecting to close. And it can take you. The question is how long will you allow that negative situation to take you away from who you want to be and where you're moving? You have to have the dream and the vision and the plan. Um, the dream, vision, and plan, first of all, at the top, and then the roadmap to get there. Uh, and then every day you have to take step by step. And sometimes you're going to fall back a couple steps, but you got to step it up and go back two more steps forward. And I remember 27 years ago, my coach said, you have to have a vision and a dream of what's your perfect client. And I, it's been so ingrained in my mind now for 28 years. I, I, it's, it just rolls out of my tongue. It says, I want clients who love me, trust me, respect me, will follow my advice, will do what I say, are rich and fun, and I can be friends with. That's my perfect client. So whenever I meet someone, whether it's just a face-to-face -face at a first time, uh, someone who contacts me about potentially listing or selling, that filter is kind of, it's like kind of like a screen when I'm talking to them. And if, if as they're talking to me, if, if they don't fall through, I mean, they don't pass that screen test, it, it, you know, I sometimes will say, you know what, I just don't think I'm the right agent for you. Um, so you have to have the vision and you have to have the mindset. And every day I work on the mindset. I mean, every night I do guided meditations before I go to bed. Even if I'm tired, I, and I do guided because the, the, the single meditations like on my own are more difficult for me because my mind keeps wandering. I have a hard time focus, focusing on nothing. So I do guided meditations and they're specifically meant to, to help you fall asleep and subconsciously go in your brain 
And, uh, but I think when I first started years ago, it says it takes six weeks minimum for that to start, you know, working on your, on your brain, brain, brain waves, right? Because once you start resting and sleeping, you go to alpha state and then that good energy goes in your mind. So affirmations uh, in the morning, meditations at night, uh, throughout the day, taking deep breaths and kind of shutting down and refocusing because you may have really, really bad news all of a sudden, but then in 10 minutes, you've got a listing appointment in front of a seller and you got to be on and sharp and happy for them and excited. You got to, sh- you got to just shut that off, put it aside and move forward. And so I do a lot of training from whether it's Anthony Robbins, um, Zig Ziglar. I mean, all the great speakers of all time. I listen to them all the time. I remember when I was commuting and I was, you know, 18, 19, 20 commuting to work every day, uh, I would have an hour to three hours in my car. Uh, and I thought, I didn't go to college. I barely graduated high school. Co- the car will be my college education. So all I did for, and even to this day, I don't listen to the radio. I don't listen to music. I'm n- listening to nothing today, but podcasts and interviews and, um, you know, now no more CDs. But, you know, I listen to educational things that will help me build my business, improve my marketing, do better videos, improve my mindset, um, Whatever it is I need that day or during that day, I just, I, my car is still my college education and that will go on forever. And I think that's part of why I've been successful because I'm, I love to learn and grow. And even though doing this 32 years, I'm constantly learning and growing. That's why even after our interview, I can't wait to have lunch with you and learn from you. And hopefully I can share and help, you know, help you learn from me as well. So. And I think that's very, very important to just listen and to understand that the most successful people in the world are successful because they're listening to how others got there and they're following the instructions of others. Yep. They're seeing that, okay, somebody has already done what I want or exactly. at least has done some aspect. Let's do some aspect of this person, that person, whether it be in the form of a podcast, a book. Right. Um, self-knowledge is super important because... <laughs> uh, there's so much that's readily accessible out there yep. that, you know, if, if you're not in a place where you want to be right now, you need to look at some of the current things that are taking up time yep. that are not getting you one step forward, that are not getting you closer to your goal. One of the things that you talked about was the subconscious. So the biggest thing that I talk about coming from an intelligence background is getting the brain to work for you. Right. So when it comes to social media, I'm huge on all the things that social media can do. But really what I'm focused on is getting social media to connect with somebody's brain and getting it to connect in a way that's different than the way other people are doing it. It's not necessarily a right or wrong way. It's a different way. And if I can enter the brain in a way that's different than other people, then I can plant my brand in in their brain. I can plant myself into their brain and I can plant different things. Um, and it's not because of, you know, the, the best social media ads and all these different things right. that a lot of people come to me for. It's right. doing things differently. And, and, and when it comes back to the mindset, you said, you know, you're listening to music and you're just allowing those thoughts and those ideas and all those things to just plant into the subconscious. So then that way, when you are doing uh, or, or when you're out at lunch or when you're talking to somebody, your brain is actually working in a, in a way that's a little bit different. Yeah than it would have. If you're just sitting at home all day watching television and filling your your brain with things that are, you know, if you're watching the news (laughs) and you're just uh, seeing all the bad things that are happening in the world, then you're not going to be thinking about um, the things that a lot of successful people think about. And as an example about that, so first of all, we talked, you talk about a lot of things. So first of all, persistence (laughs) and perseverance and never giving up is always the case. Um, With news and media, I don't ever watch the news, read the news, none of that. I mean, sometimes things pop up on my phone. I I felt this way. I mean, I don't want to have any negativity around. There's enough negativity in the world. If something really bad's happening, someone's going to tell me or I'll see it on social media, right? I don't need to wake up. I mean, so many people wake up in the morning, they turn on CNN or CNN is is NBC or whatever. And it's just, it's all negative stuff. And I just, I don't want to hear any of that. I mean, how am I going to wake up in the morning here? The economy's crashing and this is going bad and this is going bad. I got five listings I have to sell. People that have to sell their homes for whatever reason, they have to buy. It's not going to, that's, that's not going to forward them and help them. I've got to just figure it out. So I don't listen to any of that negative stuff. And I'm always testing, trying and experimenting. Always. I, I, I really enjoy that. So with the social media journey and the particular video journey was, I think it was 2009, Tom Fury had a, 
um, uh, Mastermind Summit in Palm Desert. And he brought Gary Vaynerchuk. I don't know if you, you probably weren't there at that time. And uh, Gary came, and I'd never heard of Gary Vaynerchuk before, but what he said made sense. And Google had just purchased YouTube. He's like, you guys got to be, you have to have a YouTube channel. You need to start doing videos. And I was listening to all, and then he's, and he, we, I'd met him. So I, he's like, well, you're Mr. Beverly Hills. Your lifestyle's a, a rich and famous in Beverly Hills. You need to be a DJ for content in your community. Well, just those seven words really hit me. So I'm like, DJ for content. What does that mean? I take different records and I spin that and put it out, right? So that's in my mind. I'm like, okay, I'm in Beverly Hills. I can start doing videos. Because at that time, it was mostly the written blog on the websites because websites were big in those days and it was all the, and I was not a writer. I would go to parties and events, take photos and it would take me maybe two hours, three hours to write a three, four paragraph blog. And I just, I'm not a writer. And those voice um, uh, things where they, you talk on the computer and it transcribes it, that wasn't working very well. So when he said video, I thought that makes sense to me. So I went out that afternoon at the, at the end of the day at 5.30, went to Best Buy, bought my first video camera, a flip cam, Went back to the hotel room. My assistant was there. I did my first video. And I said, why am I here in the middle of Palm Desert, middle of August, when it's 118 degrees? And I said, I'm at a conference to learn and grow and educate myself and help my clients, you know, sell their homes quicker for better prices and better marketing. And so that was my first video. And that that particular format really worked for me. It was natural. I'm a, I'm a one-take video person, like all the TV shows I do and all that. Typically, it's one or two takes in most cases. Uh, I don't like scripts. I just speak from the heart and come from the heart. And that really made sense for me. So I just started doing videos and just doing more and more and more. And I think it was about four years into doing videos. Talk about consistency. And I'd done about 800 videos at that time. And Tom was my coach. And I said, Tom, I've been doing all these videos. I have like 880 videos online, but it's not monetizing. Because to me, if I'm going to do something, particularly in a business world, I want to be able to see results financially from that endeavor. And nothing was happening. He says, keep doing what you're doing. Keep doing what you're doing. It's going to happen. And I think it was 30, 30 days later, maybe 60 days later, I got this random phone call, like being ready. I'm at the office. My assistant, like maybe 930 in the morning, my assistant says, this lady would like to talk to you. He spoke on the phone for 45 minutes. She'd been looking for a home with another broker in my company for a year and a half. Uh, wasn't finding what she wanted. She wanted to spend around 10, 12 million to buy, and then she was going to sell her house for 5 million. And so we talked about you know, what she wanted and what she was doing. And, and I said, well, how'd you find out about me? She said, I saw some of your videos. I said, really? I said, which videos? She said, I saw two of your videos. And I said, which ones? She said, I saw your driving tour of Bel Air and I saw your helicopter tour. I said, well, what made you call me from those videos? She said, well, you were very honest. I said, well, how so? She said, your driving tour of Bel Air, we were about to buy a house in Bel Air, and uh, you talked about it being a canyon area, being very rustic and close to Beverly Hills and a very, you know, foresty kind of community. But you said, if you're a sun lover, it's probably not for you because you're in a canyon. So the sun will rise three or four hours later in the morning and will set three or four hours earlier in the afternoon. And we were about to buy this house. We went there at three o'clock in the afternoon. There was no sun at the pool. And she said, the second reason I called you is she said, your helicopter tour video, she said, if you'd spend that much money on a helicopter tour, you'll spend money to market my house. So <clears throat> long and short of it, she says, my husband wants to meet with you in person to interview you as our buyer's agent. And I'm like, I'd never been interviewed as a buyer's agent. But I figured, okay, potentially $10, $12 million purchase, $5 million sale. I had to go at 8.30 at night to his house to meet him. And he is a very, very big lawyer, partner in a major real estate law firm that has several offices around the country. And so I went in, you know, lawyer style outfit, three piece suit, pinstripe with the tie, the whole thing, yellow legal notepad. And I sat down, I said, uh, do you mind if I take notes? And I opened the notepad, started taking notes, and I started asking him lots of questions. About half an hour into asking him, and he answered every single, I mean, big time lawyer, he answered every question. It was very specific about what they were looking for, what happened and all that stuff. And I could feel it was right. And I said, uh, I kind of put my notepad down, I said, um, I like you, and I think you like me. Why don't we just get started? And I just kind of just kind of made it casual. He says, Christoph, my wife decided to hire you the first time she spoke to you on the phone. And I kind of laughed, and I said, then what am I doing here for this interview? <laughs> he says, I just wanted to meet you in person. Uh. And we got it started, and 30 days later, they bought a house for just over $10 million, And I sold So between the house they bought, I sold their house for $4.4. Uh, their a friend bought for me for $5 million, And I've done three other deals. So we did like $26 million in sales. 22 million of it the first 90 days after we met and the others over time but again from videos but it took four years to start monetizing and that was the first monetization of videos so I, I knew the video was the right platform 
I kept doing it. Tom said, keep doing it. My wife said, keep doing it. And eventually, like your wife said, it wasn't just luck. It wasn't just, oh, just a miracle. It, it, was, it was many years of hard work and time that brought that opportunity to me. What I love when I'm talking to other people is when I ask them questions that revolve around how they are helping other people, how they're putting their goals and their needs um, <clears throat> at the top of their, their checklist and not worrying about all the things that are, you know, coming in front of them from a daily basis, yep. whether it be from the news or a new program or a new something that's going to take away their time from doing what they love. Uh, when they talk about helping people, they start what I would call ranting off and uh, <laughs> they start smiling and they start having good expression. And, and that's exactly what you just did if you didn't notice it. But what's great about that is you'll know you're doing the right things when you start what I consider lighting up like a Christmas tree. Yeah. When you start doing the things that excite you, that give you that <clears throat> natural energy, yeah. Yeah. that do all of these different things. And you don't know exactly why it's happening and why you're doing all these things now, but what you do know is that you're doing the right things for the right people. Yep. Uh, and what you talked about, you know, when it came from social media is that you, the thing that came across was uh, more so the fact that you were just telling the truth. And the reason that you were telling the truth, I'm going to assume is that you don't want somebody to move in to a Canyon area that, you know, three months later, they figure out that there's actually no sun here. Then they right. call you back and they say, Hey, look, this was a terrible uh, investment for right. me. And it's right. all your fault. Right. Um, I think that, you know, telling the truth is super important. And another thing that you previously said was everybody is not going to be the perfect fit for you. Exactly. And you have to be able to know that that person's not going to be a good fit because one, it's taking you away from your goals. It's taking mm. you away from your family. Yep. Uh, it's adding some stress or anxiety that you know that you just do not want into your life. Yep. Yep. Um, I think too many people are saying yes when they should be saying no at sometimes. What would you give uh, as a piece of advice to somebody that just says yes to everything. Well, that's, that's for, for me, I don't want to judge anyone, but it's totally the wrong decision. Uh, I quite often say no when it's not the right fit, the wrong neighborhood, the wrong energy with the client. There's many reasons why I'll say no. And sometimes just having more free time. I mean, making money and all that's nice, but does making, you know, when I was young and starting out, all I wanted was material things. I wanted the fancy cars and all the jewelry and the expensive clothes and the fancy house. And luckily in my life, I've pretty much achieved and um, been able to work hard to be able to buy the, the physical material things that I've wanted. But now being almost 51 years old, I realized all those material things are nice and lovely and I do enjoy them. I'd rather have them than not have them, but they don't give you fulfillment or happiness. If anything, they can be the opposite. You buy something very expensive and wonderful and the first hour or two or day, it's really exciting. You're like, oh my God, I can't believe this diamond watch or, or piece of art I bought. But then all of a sudden, that, that excitement wanes off very quickly and then you want something. You can never satiate that desire. You always want something bigger, better, more and more. And there's nothing wrong with that if that's what makes you happy and excited. But it no longer excites me like I thought it would my whole life. It just, it actually becomes more problems because when you have expensive things, you have to insure them. You have to worry about them. You worry about losing them or getting them stolen or, and you know, things happen in life. And, and then all of a sudden the thing you work so hard for is gone and it's a material thing, but things that you work very hard for that are not gone is love and relationships and kindness and doing things for others. So you talked about, you know, kind of helping others and doing that. I'm glad you brought that up because Real estate is great and I love what I do, but doing things for others is like you talked about what you do is probably one of the most fulfilling things for me in my life. Uh, I, when I was young, my father divorced my mom when I was three years old, so I didn't really know him. My stepfather and I didn't really get along. Uh, he and I were like oil and water. I had big dreams of being rich and famous, not really famous, but rich and live this extravagant life. He was a very kind of plain down to earth kind of guy. And he's like, well, you should just go bag grocery stores at the supermarket. And, you know, you got to go to school. You got to go to college. You got to wear jeans and tennis shoes and T-shirts. That was not me. I was not a jeans, tennis shoes, T-shirt kind of guy. So we fought a lot because I had a different vision than he did. Um, but I didn't have support. But I had a couple teachers, my um, junior high school art yearbook teacher, and then a couple teachers in high school that even though I didn't get good grades, even though I was smart, I just didn't like to study. They believed in me and they knew, they'd say, I don't know how you're going to do it, but you're going to make a success of yourself. So just those words made a difference. So once I started becoming successful, I all of a sudden, you know, when you, you ask for things, when I was young, I started working with the I Have a Dream Foundation. I thought I had these couple teachers that didn't really mentor me, but they, 
even though I had no support around me personally, these teachers were supportive. So I thought, why can't I help other young youth support them in their dreams? So I became a mentor for I Have a Dream Foundation, which I really loved. And to this day, uh, the youth I helped, I'm still friends with, and they're adults, and they're successful, and I'm hopefully was a part of that. But then I got the opportunity, maybe 14 years ago, a friend called and said, uh, there's a homeless shelter in Hollywood called Covenant House, and they're looking for a new board member, and would you go talk to them and see about it? So I didn't know anything about it, didn't know anything about homelessness, or homeless youth in particular, so I went there to meet with them, and they said, would you join the board? And I thought, wow, and I talked to my wife about it. She says, look, instead of helping one or two one-on-one as a mentor, which is great, as a board member with your connections, you can help a lot more by fundraising, you know, developing things and all this kind of stuff. So uh, so I joined the board and my first job, the first day on the board is like, okay, you got to help us open up a shelter in Oakland. I'm like, what? Huh. And so anyways, I basically found, helped open the shelter in Oakland, which we now have, which is great. So we now have two facilities uh, here in California. And uh, I was uh, the chairman for the big gala where we raised, I think the first time we raised 500000 one night at a charity event. But I'm still involved with Covenant House. And one of the things I love to do more than any, look, I love a nice lifestyle of a beautiful home and a nice warm bed. Every year I do a sleep out where I sleep on the streets of Hollywood to raise money for homeless youth and awareness. And uh, this will be my fifth year, I think, in 2019, maybe sixth year. So this last year I did a team for the first time. I had six people join me. This year, our local president is going to be with us, which is from Coa Banker, which is amazing. So I hope to have at least 20 or 25 people join us. And Sign me up. Yeah, wonderful. And it just, it's just one night sleeping on the streets. Just to, I remember the first time I did it is, the, the, the point is to try to understand just for a night what these youth are dealing with. And it was very difficult. But these kids come here with a dream of moving to Hollywood and becoming an actor or celebrity, becoming rich and famous. That's their dream. And they come here at the bus station and the drug dealers and the, uh, the prostitution rings and now the child slavery rings are all there to find them. And it's really sad what happens. But I figured if we can help these kids get off the streets and help them, because and I, and I believe in a lot of charities and you know, helping people get water in Africa and food around the world, that's important. But to me, I was born in this country. I'm an American. We got to start at home first, I believe. And you know, Hollywood is literally five minutes east of Beverly Hills. And that's the hardest thing for me to, to fathom is that Beverly Hills is one of the most um, wealthy and prosperous communities in the world. And yet five miles east of you, not even five miles, there's so many youth on the streets that have nothing that have to resort to prostitution, selling drugs, whatever they have to do just to survive. So whatever I can do to help them, that gives me the most fulfillment in life. I have to say that's uh, really enjoyable. And, and by doing that, I have gotten a lot of business from it. I never even thought about it when I started helping. I did it to do the right thing and help them. And a lot of wonderful things have happened to me because I've gotten so much more benefit out of helping the homeless youth than probably I have given to them in my mind, you know, so. And I think that's the exact same thing for me is that, you know, the thing that excites me and makes me uh, do the things that I'm doing now is the fact that if I can help somebody else in their lives get to a place where they want to be, then it's, it's super rewarding. And going back to people that are just continually saying yes to things, if, if that's taking you away from the things that um, you're super passionate about, right. whether it's helping others, wh- whether it's your family, whether it's all of those things, you have to really just look and say, is it really worth it? Is yeah. it really worth yeah. me staying up every single night uh, with so much stress and anxiety and I can't even sleep because I'm thinking about how that person cussed me out today because he said I was the worst person in that you know, I'm the worst agent. He would never work with me again. Right, and, you right. know, the escrow is falling apart and all these things are happening. Right. You attract the, the right kind of people. And right. it starts from day one of setting clear expectations right. of who you are, what you stand for. Right. And if that just doesn't match with the person sitting across the table from you, you just have to be willing to say no. Yeah. And I think one thing that I, that is probably one of the biggest challenges I have to face every day is when things don't go the way you expect them to, or hope them to, or something goes sideways is, or like you said, someone says you're a bad agent or whatever. I mean, that can happen anyway. It's happened to me. You have to let those things go. You have to really just, you know, they're having, and this is happening maybe twice or three, actually three times in my career, I was involved with a deal with a client and they called me and kind of told me off and cursed me off. And I was like, where's this coming from? Right. And I was kind of shocked. And at first I was kind of the inner child is hurt. And I'm like, I'm really good. What did they do wrong? And I'm like, no, it's not me. They're probably just having a bad day. In every case, the next day they called me and said, I'm really so sorry. I was having a problem with X, Y, and Z. It's never me. 
they're having other issues and I happen to be the sounding board that time. So, so whenever there's a problem or something upsetting, I think the quicker you can let go, either you fix it and solve it or you let it go. It's one of the two. And if you, and most times you just certain things you can't fix, you got to just let it go and not give it any energy. Cause if you're giving energy to that negativity and those bad thoughts or what they've said, you're re- you're recreating that or building it in your world. Because whatever we think about comes about. Like that old book by um, James Allen, As a Man Thinketh. It's such a simple concept, but whatever we think about comes about. So if you're thinking all day long about the negative things and the bad things or things that have upset you, you're going to create more of that in your life. So those things do happen to all of us, sometimes multiple times a day. I notice it. I try to fix it or take care of it or put it aside and focus on what I can do and who I can help. I like to give a great example I, I'm always passionate about providing value and just seeing other people smile to me is, is super awesome. And every morning, if I'm continually ingraining that into my brain, then it just naturally happens whether I'm at home or I'm away. We were at a real estate conference and I woke up and mm-hmm. Facebook pinged me uh, the different birthdays that were happening for the day. And I saw Christoph's name pop up. And the first thing that I thought of was, Everybody's going to tell him happy birthday on this post. I'm going to walk downstairs. I'm going to buy him a birthday card and I'm going to go hand deliver it to him because I know that's doing things a little bit differently. Right. It wasn't to impress you. It wasn't to uh, do anything other than to see you smile. And yeah. I handed you the card and we actually have it filmed. Uh, and you were just shocked and surprised because I'm assuming not everybody in that entire stadium or audience uh, you know, handed you a card and it's sometimes it's just a simple thing. It was the only one. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, one of the most important things that Deepak Chopra talks about, which is always in my, in my mind, appreciation, attention, and affection. Uh, that just should be a rule of everyone's life. And, you know, everyone craves those three things, right? And whether it's a client, a friend, your loved one, your spouse, your sister, someone on the street, a homeless person. You know, I, I talk to these homeless youth and, you know, and I, and I really, we, we have Thanksgiving together, we sit down and I really try to delve into how they got where they are, what's important to them, what, would have, what, what helps them get out of their state of mind. And they said, you know, sometimes when you're homeless on the street, people just walk and they just kind of don't even want to talk because you're afraid if you look at them, they're going to ask you for money or something, right? They just want someone to just say, hello, how are you today? Just attention, affection, and appreciation. So I keep those three A's in my mind all the time. And the WIFM, what's in it for me? So when I meet people, I'm also going to say, what's in it for them? And how can I give them attention, appreciation, and affection? It could be a small little thing. It could be just bringing someone a flower from your garden. It could be like you did, bringing me the card. Or uh, like with, you know, with birthdays on Facebook, thank God we have Facebook to remind us nowadays. Yeah, you can send a little happy birthday. You can send a happy birthday with a photo. Or you can do a video, a personal video. It takes you 40 seconds, 30 seconds. I try to do it every day, but a lot of times I get caught up in my business and I'm like, oh, I should do it. And then all of a sudden, 6 o'clock at night, I haven't done it. But um, it's just giving someone the attention and kindness knowing that you're thinking of them and you care about them because you never know when they really need that. And you, you could be doing it right at the moment where they really, really need someone to know, to know that someone cares about them because they could be having a serious problem with something or a serious illness. Who knows? So always give love in those things, and I think you can't go wrong. Always keep your mind, mind eyes, and heart open for miracles and opportunity. If you're in a negative place, thinking negatively or, or too much in your own head, you won't be able to see the opportunities that are out there. So you have to keep open to those things because they are out there all the time. We have to just be able to have a clear enough mind and an open mind that we can pay attention when those things are around us. It's like what the reticular activating sensors. Yep. So if you have that mindset of where's my next opportunity? Where's my miracle today? Are you my next miracle? Are you my next opportunity? So uh, so kind of when I meet people, I'm like, and it's like a new introduction. If something, nothing is random in the universe. I really think that everyone you meet, every situation... There's something in that that you need to look at and try to discover what that is. So, but if we're too caught up in our head or being upset or negative, you're not going to even see those things. You're going to be like, oh, but sometimes there was an old thing that, um, that I was told, play the perfect game. When opportunities come your way, say yes. Now, it's very different than our saying no we talked about earlier, but it's kind of the same thing on the reverse. Sometimes you get opportunities or people ask you to do things and like, oh, I don't want to do that. But then I kind of think about it in a more open way you know, wait a minute, the universe is offering me something here. Why don't I try it and see what's down that road? Uh, Like they say, there's no cheese down that tunnel. Well, maybe there's a lot of cheese down that tunnel. So, you know, I think being open to opportunities as well is another important aspect. 
for everybody listening, where can they connect with you if they have questions, if they just want to see some of the things that you're doing, uh, or maybe they just want to, you know, start <laughs> selling luxury houses overnight. <laughs> so uh, thank you for asking that, first of yes. all. So probably the best way over all, my Facebook has been full for a long time. So you can follow me on Facebook. If you send me a friend request, I will send you to my business page. But my business page is mostly business. It's not so personal. Instagram is a great way. You can follow me on Instagram. There's no limit there. So that's really kind of everything I do is on Instagram, IGTV. Uh, also my YouTube channel. I try any video I do, it goes on YouTube. So there you can, and you subscribe, uh, which is great, because then you can see kind of, it's all over. It's parties, it's fun, it's mindset things. It's, uh, I'm doing more and more like day-to-day, -day, like actual activities, like how do I sell a house? How do I market a house? So we're doing more and more of that. So look, just Google my name, Christoph, you'll find me all over the place. Uh, don't look for the fake profiles, because there's a lot of them. But <laughs> 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 but uh, yeah, find me all over the place. Uh, I do try to respond to all the comments that I get. I like to interact with people that follow me, because I really do appreciate that. And uh, I like getting to know, and I've met a lot of great friendships from social media, which has been nice. Is people just randomly follow me, and the ones I make friends with are those that talk to me and chat with me. And and I'll be honest, sometimes on birthdays, I'll like delete people because I'm like, well, who's this? It's their birthday popped up. I never see them on Facebook. They never communicate. I don't see their posts. Goodbye. You know. So so I think it's important if you're on social media, try to, to try to talk to people and uh, communicate and and be social and. And uh, it's, like an, uh, it's like an online cocktail party. <laughs> and, you know, you need to talk to people. <laughs> awesome. Well, again, we're super appreciative of your time. We're grateful for you uh, having us here. And, again, for those listening, make sure that you connect with Christoph. It's Christoph Chu, C-H-O-O. And we will see you guys next week. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan, for having me. Thank you. Cool. Thanks. Hey, everybody. This is Jonathan Hawkins. Thank you so much for staying until the very end of this podcast. I definitely appreciate it. As always, make sure to reach out to me via social media at Jonathan Hawkins Official. Send me a comment. Shoot me a DM. If you have any questions, you can also comment below. Thank you so much. Don't forget to subscribe below. And remember, who you hire truly matters.